Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Too Many Men podcast, two episodes in one week. What is happening? I am Allison Lucan, and I am joined by the, I don't know, you looked like you had some fun last night, Sarah. I think we need some details, and you looked yeah. amazing. Oh my God, the man. one and only living her best life, Sarah Sivian. Sarah, how are you? Oh, yeah, I'm great. Yep, been putting in the work lately, so... We got to have some play too. It's my friend's birthday. So we're going a little hard for that. We're having fun. We're turning 30, everybody. Let's go. <laughs> and we, of course, would not be too many men without folks. She made upcycled sweatshirts. She transitioned into vests. And now we have entered jacket territory. What can't she do? Shana Goldman, say hi. Hi. Good job. Okay. <laughs> well, we hope you all enjoyed our last big, huge, massive trade deadline recap where I don't know if we ever figured out the rules to our buy or sell game, but we got through it and discussed what we wanted to discuss. Before we get into the show, I was remiss. I didn't ask you both what you think of our new open. Wow. Yeah, okay. No thought. notes. <laughs> What, Shayna? <laughs> I'm like, wait, which one of us are you queuing up? I follow the rules here. <laughs> We're very a rule-based podcast. I like it. I listen to the intro and then I turn off the podcast because I can't I listen anymore. I know. Let's not advertise that to the people. No, don't do that. If you're going to do our podcast, we side. don't. <laughs> Just listen to the intro. Do what I do. Listen to the intro, put it on silent, and give us some time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's like that's the equivalent of a of a slow Little scroll. scroll. That we, ask for. <laughs> we have so many <laughs> rules today. If you're gonna listen to us and consume our content, please do it this way. <laughs> We're subliminally giving you the hockey takes. <laughs> unmute it and then just unmute it for like five seconds every like eight minutes and try to figure out what the fuck we're talking about and then go back to silence. <laughs> yes. The game. <laughs> I was pretty proud of our new open. So I hope I know, you all I think like it's it. great. I we'd think love it's to great. we'd it's great. We'd love to hear what you people think. If you even know. So I even had to change it because do you notice it goes too many men, too many men. And then there's a big oh <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. So anyway, um, I thought that was fun. But enough about the open, the like five seconds of our show before we get into this wonderful, glorious content that everyone is listening to on full volume. Sarah, what time is it? Time for putting the original sound from musicians on and the bit. There bit we go. Oh, news. <laughs> I think it was the best one yet. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> that was amazing. All right. Um, let's get into it. We have all kinds of stuff to talk about. Let's talk about the buildings first, in which our teams play and live. And let's talk about a building that may not even exist yet, but is hockey going to come back to Atlanta? There's a proposal on the table with some financial bank, excuse me, backing. Sarah, I know you immediately had some thoughts on this. Why don't you walk us through what has been announced Again, supposedly with the support of some people with a lot of money to put behind this and what your thoughts are on it. Right. I'm pretty conflicted on it because on one hand, I do think this has failed twice in Atlanta. And I think you look back, though, there's the lockout. There's ownership not being correct. There's GMs mishandling the situation. Sorry, Don. We like our group now. But there's also uh, the like. The need for expansion feels really like, okay, let's make a billion dollars as quick as possible. Let's do record profits. Like so many businesses and business owners find themselves in these positions these days or put themselves in these positions. So it's like, we're finally in a place in the NHL, I feel, where we're making strides with marketing. Like players are getting notoriety that they haven't gotten before. Like you got Bedard, you got McDavid kind of speaking up. You got these brand deals with Austin Matthews, things like that. Like, I think we're finally making some strides. We're not there yet, but I don't think the right way to go about it is to just keep it. I think making what you already have a better product is what we should be doing. But that being said, 
Anson Carter is the absolute right person to bring hockey to Atlanta and the circumstances are different this time. And like you said, there's so much money that could be used correctly here. I don't like that it's not in the city. I feel like every expansion team that exists that's in a city has really been a success story. Like you've got the Kraken. I mean, it's not, you can't really call it success yet because it's so young, but like it's doing really well in terms of expanding. The Golden Knights are doing really well, of course. And then they're in the city, but like, I don't know, you think about Panthers and their struggles, Jets and their struggles with attendance. Like you got to kind of do this right, do it in the city, don't cut corners. But I just don't, I don't know. It's like, what about relocation? I have so many thoughts on this clearly and we'll get to them. <laughs> well, yeah. And then I think absolutely you've outlined, there's like 13 different considerations to this. And so let's talk first about the idea of adding a new team, right? So let's, let's take the market per se out of it yet. Let's take relocation out of it yet. Shane, I know this is something you had thought a lot about too. If we add one team, we're to 33 teams and that's a wonky number. And expansion has always happened at least either right at the same time or pretty darn close to two at a time. And there's the whole question of parity and equity in terms of the number of teams in each conference in each division, just in terms of adding a team. Is this the right thing to do? No, I don't. I think 32 is a number to kind of settle at, because I think when you get to 32, like you said, it's not going to be just one. Are there cities that you could see happening to get to 34 immediately. Of course, you can go Houston, you can go Utah, like up oh, now you can go to 36, which is exactly what I think would have to happen if you hit 32. I don't think you should want divisions to be misaligned. And I know it's like, well, the conferences can be even and you can have 17 teams a pop and that's great and wonderful, but I don't like the ideas of, of imbalanced divisions and there's no way to do them with 17 teams that you're gonna have equality. And I think that's a problem, right? So now we're already jumping to 36 and that could be a 10 year process. Sure. But is it the door to open right now when you should just focus on maybe maximizing all 32? Like there are too many issues. I don't think you can be thinking expansion, adding a new team. So you have a little bit more stability with all 32 clubs. And that's what you go right back to the coyotes. Then, and you say, well, here we go. Like until they're on stable ground with an arena, with their entire situation, I know now we're seeing reports of like, look at the gates that they made and yada, yada, yada against the big market teams. That's great. Wonderful. But like, that's not the consistency. That's not what's happening. So until they're stabilized, I don't think you can think about team 33, period. I don't think because you're not just thinking 33, you're thinking 34, 35, 36. I love how I said you've already broken the rules because I said not relocation. I said just adding a team. No, but I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying teasing. don't I'm teasing. add a team because I'm saying hard no. I'm teasing. Yeah, hard I'm no. Teasing. And here's my two reasons why. So let's go to the next part of it, Sarah, that you brought up. And that is the idea of, is it a problem with the market per se? Or is this a place where hockey should come back to? I'd love to see it come back right. I mean, you think about diversity in Atlanta and you, you the, pers the place that they want to have the rink in is not particularly diverse. But I, I think with community outreach, like somebody like Anson Carter is so involved in the community. I think having him kind of spearhead the movement is a really good sign. I'd like more hockey in the South. I do think it can work. You, you have to do it right though. Like you think, I don't know, I'm not the biggest... I don't know if I should, I don't know, I'm just saying it all today, but not the biggest fan of Tom Dundon. He's a billionaire. Like we can get into that. But like, I think the way he operates the team is really, it's good for a small market where you're kind of going by your own rules and you are spending money. Like people say, oh, the Canes don't spend money. Like that was a thing of the past. Now Dundon has spent to the cap every single year. And it's kind of, you just have to have that investment. You look at kind of Peter Carmanos when, the team was always in relocation rumors. And it was just kind of like, because there were obvious things he could do, but he was penny pinching instead. And it's like, you really have to run this like Vegas. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. So what we do know is we know that we aren't against the idea of hockey in Atlanta. We feel like it's probably not a good idea to add more teams because we don't, we're still in a situation where revenue sharing has to happen to help some teams that can't make the same amount of money. So now Shana Goldman, let's bring the Coyotes formally into the picture. And I want to be careful and say here too, like 
this is getting thrown around a lot. And my heart breaks for the fans of the Coyotes because this is no fun just to basically hear about your favorite team potentially ceasing to exist. But the narrative seems to have been Coyotes are not going to be able to make this work. Oh, Salt Lake City is right there. Is Atlanta perhaps a better option? Although timing comes into this, of course. But if all things were equal, would you rather have uh, the Coyotes move to Atlanta or Salt Lake City? I would say keep them in the West because if you shift them to Atlanta, who are you shifting back to the Western Conference? Columbus and Detroit are not... If they were in central time zones, I think it would be fine, right? Because the Blackhawks and the Blues manage it, but they're not. And I feel like that's tough for home fans to deal with. The travel will be a lot more. Like, there's a reason that they shifted them. Could Detroit being back in the same division with Chicago and St. Louis be super exciting? Like, absolutely. We'd all love it. But I think logistically, we know why they moved. So that's where I would struggle with it. Um, I kind of feel like a fresh start would be the better move here for Arizona to go to that new market and get this brand new opportunity if that, if they were to move. Um, And it's not a knock on Atlanta. Like I think Atlanta could be a really great idea, but to me that that franchise has had so much instability that I would worry about sending them to a place that has failed twice. And, you know, you're putting in so much legwork to then rebalance everything. Right. Giving them that new chance. Right. Exactly. Like it it has failed twice and that matters. I mean, we can look at the context of it, but it's still true. Like why doesn't a different team, like a different area get a chance? I know Houston and Salt Lake City have been in rumors. So it's kind of like, I don't know, maybe give somebody else a chance to succeed. But if there's, there's a reason people keep getting pulled to Atlanta because they could be great. Yeah. I struggled. I mean, I listen, I've been to both Atlanta and Salt Lake City quite a bit and I like them both for different reasons. And like, Every time Salt Lake City comes up as like the home for a new NHL team, I I don't, I, it's I can't, it it's, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't yeah. track for me. And I love Salt Lake City. Let me be clear. It's beautiful. I had a great time when I was there, but like, I don't know. It just feels weird to me. It, People don't really go there to be like watching a hockey game. Right. Yeah. They have what, one professional team and it's an NBA team. So it's like, in theory, maybe that works arena wise. And that's where it's it's tough because then if you're talking about the Coyotes, should you expand the conversation to have Atlanta or should you just be saying Houston versus Salt Lake City? And I feel like there's a good argument for both because you're staying in the West. And not only that, like then you can compare and contrast two very yeah. different markets with different potential. Like you look at how teams do in Houston and maybe that will give you a little bit more like faith that that would work for the Coyotes specifically. You know, like it, it's it's so tough. I feel like Utah is exciting because it's a, a new name to hockey, similar to like Vegas yeah. was. And there's that advantage of not having much competition in the market. But would it does it help or hurt? You know, it depends on how much outreach you're going to do with the team there that already exists as well. Like that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, I, I don't know. Houston <laughs> because Nate's parents live there. It's and all we, about me. I was going to say, we are nothing if not completely, solely, individually motivated yeah. for our satisfaction yeah, here. Exactly. We're all the exactly. maple leaves. It's fun. <laughs> we all have a little maple leaf in us. <laughs> well, let's, let's uh, you know, Atlanta, hey, listen, we're here for it, but I think it, it'd be fun and we're not anti having a team go there. But from a business perspective, it, it maybe seems not like a fully cooked idea just yet. But we've been talking around this coyote situation. Wait, can, can I ask something? I don't know. Can if, you? May 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 I ask? <laughs> okay. Wow. Say the <laughs> NHL goes thirty six teams, right? And we've, yes. we've been discussing now three potential landing spots. We have Houston, we have Utah, we have Atlanta. Who would be the fourth team to keep everything balanced, east and west? Because everyone's going to say, "Well, you have Quebec, you have Hartford. Do you go for the cities you know for both teams in the east and go?" They're not going to go to west? Quebec. They're just not. no. I don't think so. Is or there, Hartford. People romanticize that so much, but even when the franchise was dying, not enough people showed up. Like, yeah, yeah. it just do you was go not to another working. Canadian team. Do you do like yes. Hamilton? Is that the move? The Saskatoon Saskers. <laughs> I want West, Salt Lake though. City because Salt Lake Soakers would be a name, but they're not going <laughs> to do that. No. <laughs> I, I feel like they have to do something in Canada. I mean, attendance usually goes well in Canada. Like, it's just. They need to do that. They need to optimize that there, but I don't know where they would go. That's the thing. It would be really hard, I feel like, to pick one more Eastern franchise because everyone would be so connected to what already exists there versus yeah. something new. 
that's why we're like, okay, why do we need 700 more teams? Like, this is the circular conversation for right. me. It's like, okay, we don't need really any more teams. Let's just focus on what we have. Right, right. Yeah, and again, Arizona, you know, it, it's, I, I personally, whenever people ask, I always say just go follow and listen and read Craig Morgan because he's the yeah. writer that's been embedded there for years and seems to have the very, it doesn't seem to have, he has the best hand on the situation, but it looks like, Unfortunately, we're coming more to the end of the road out there um, than I know their fans would like. But it's just, it's just insane that they're playing in a building and and they've they, they're claiming they had five games that got over a million dollars. Like that's insane. Just five of forty one. Like that's wild. That's not. Yeah. And so now all these other teams have to share money with that. Like it's just crazy. The 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 way that they try to like paint things to be like look things are okay is so <laughs> like the pretzels they took like know. look we have five games out of this a rice. slice we'll of rice like, it makes yeah, it so much they're, worse they're, they're claiming they have a full bag of rice all the time and it's like we know you don't when they're like hey look our operating costs <laughs> are so much lower so we're making a profit and it's like that isn't necessarily like the win you think it is and i feel like they didn't even lean it like look we can have this college environment look how cool it is but it's like but you haven't embraced it enough you did for a minute and gave up absolutely no i totally it's gonna be interesting to see all right uh there were some other big headlines that went down around the trade deadline that um they're a little bit older now but we didn't get to talk about them because we went into our extravaganza recap on our last episode um, but wanted to address just some concerns around the deadline and some changes that happened around the deadline. And the first is uh, the, the coach who had alternating cheers of fire him and then we're sorry to him last season, Lindy Ruff, <clears throat> excuse me, is officially out in New Jersey. The team has sputtered quite a bit. And I want to set this up with my own uh, fallacious remark and that when this went down, I put in our text chat bad goaltending strikes again. And Shayna, you had some very immediate thoughts. And so while we know that New Jersey's goaltending certainly did need improving and probably still does, that narrative, which I'm seeing a lot in hockey right now, isn't necessarily the whole story. What do you think about this firing? Why was this the necessary move for this team? Yeah, like is goaltending problem number one in New Jersey? Yes. Did Lindy Ruff sign those goalies like you said? No. So that's all well and good, but it's it's what's going on in front of the net. And sometimes it's hard to pay attention to that when your goaltenders are just allowing a ton of goals. It was the same conversation two years ago, but I think there were other issues. Like you kind of saw it last year. What revitalized rough behind the bench in New Jersey was the assistant coaches that they brought in. And the thing that we don't know enough is like how the like power structure is there, who controls what. Is it that the assistant coaches are the ones saying, this is what I want to run and you get to do it? Or is it they're better at executing rough vision? So that's always tricky to know. But what we do actually know is that like certain players were just underperforming this year. Jonas Siegenthaler has been like the picture of stability for them has been trash. John Marino has had a terrible season, which is really uncharacteristic for him. Timo Meyer has basically had a middle six usage and underperformed. And it's not just the injury to open the year. Like, he wasn't even played on the right side at all in New Jersey or with top players a lot of the time when that's how he clicked in San Jose. And then you see guys like Holtz not getting much opportunity. So I think that there were a lot of things building below the surface, but the goaltending is the most obvious part of it, um, that it just felt like they needed a change. Even it could, it's as simple as saying sometimes you need a new voice, you need a new direction, you need someone to shake it up. So it makes sense why they did it. It just, it's so late. They, there were 20 opportunities in the season, if I like to do this, that road trip out West to lose games in the worst way to teams like the Ducks, you know, that was probably the backbreaker. And that game against the Kings, that's like second period, you're like, yep, there it is. Like, you have to make that change tomorrow. And Sarah, the change is made. And as Shana says, it's probably too little too late. But this is a team that even unfortunately with a new boss bench still can't even get the new coaching bump. They've lost their last two, both versus Carolina and New York. Obviously, two really good teams in the Metro and in the East. But still, what do you think about the leadership in terms of coaching situation in New Jersey right now? Yeah, I mean, this had little to do with the coach, if you ask me. And like Shana touched on that a lot. It's not just about the goaltending, but it is heavily about the goaltending and it's about the whole roster just not clicking. And then you have 
you trade Tyler Toffoli, who's like the only clutch player on the team. And it's kind of like, of course, you can't expect them to win. And it was more like in this situation, the coaching change was not them saying, okay, we need to squeeze everything out of this season. I think it was pretty clear that everyone's kind of giving up on this season. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch because New Jersey is a team I know that we've all kind of been intrigued by and thought we're on the up and up, particularly after last year. And now a step back and they're going to have to fix some pieces in the off season for sure. All right. Another bit of uh, news around the deadline and this stuff I always find very, very interesting because as everyone knows, I love to think about team dynamics and communication, but um, it got a lot of traction and it got lost in all the moves that went down, but everyone knows that Calgary's goaltender, Jacob Markstrom, who's having a great rebound year was potentially on the block, potentially off the block. We never knew if a deal was in place. New Jersey was rumored to be a suitor. And then, and I'm quoting the reporting of Eric Francis, he finally came out and said publicly, um, everyone in here, I really respect everything that's being, that's been going on and not going on and how everyone in this room has handled everything. I think it's been really good. And then the whole situation and everything, am I happy about that? No, I'm not. I think it could have been handled a lot different from up top. We say it all the time, but I'll say it again. It's easy to forget that these are real people with real lives and real families being talked about in the press and families being affected in terms of moving and children being pulled out of schools or being separated from their parents. What do we make of these Markstrom comments? Is this going to be a bigger problem? There's still the very strong likelihood that Markstrom is not with the Flames next year, but we also know players talk. So what do you make of this, Sarah? It's like the SpongeBob meme where SpongeBob is watching them go jellyfishing. It's like everybody who wanted to be traded from Calgary got traded and he's still there. Like, that's not really fair. And I think the goalies have had it. I mean, you've heard Jeremy Swayman's comments about arbitration. He was like, I really hated the way that was handled. Like they goalie is such a fickle position, right? Especially if you're trying to do a mid season trade where it's like, there's only two or three of them on the roster. So you can't really, it's harder to manage them on the roster. And then there's the whole aspect of like, how do you, it's such a big part of the team. So I understand both sides of this, like it's still not fair and they still need to treat goalies better and not kind of jerk them around and just say, Hey, we're probably not going to trade you instead of like stringing him along. But also I get why it's tougher than other positions. And Markstrom did have some protection in his contract. So the team did have to go to him with some options. And I think part of the frustration was that the rumor or who knows how close it was to not being a rumor, but that a move to New Jersey might be happening for Markstrom. Shayna, is this a black mark? on the Flames leadership, or is this just a player being more willing to share how they're feeling and that's valuable and important and we continue along? I think it'd be a little bit of both, right? Like it's hard for a rookie GM, I'm sure, who came into a really tough situation. And like, I don't think that there's like a book on how to navigate this exactly, especially when it's like, there's so many players, you have players publicly wanting to leave the team. You have players getting moved from the team. You have all your pending UFAs to manage first. And then this goaltending situation, which has enough wrinkles because of the term on his contract and salary retention, everything like that. I I don't think it was easy for Craig Conroy, but I think at the end of the day, you need to try to be as up. Like, we don't know how it obviously went down, but you do need to try to be a human being with someone, especially if you're saying we might need you to waive your, you know, trade clauses to allow movement And now you're letting the goalie know this might happen. Like you kind of have to like fill them in. And like, we don't know how we found out that the deal wasn't happening. Right. Or how it was like, there's just a way to be a human and be upfront, especially because it's not a secret what Calgary is doing that they're selling. And you don't want to sour relations when now you have to deal with this in the summer and you still have this player for two years, especially when they've been your most valuable player. I think it's rare. We hear players speak up about it. I love that. We're hearing it. I hope we do more. Um, because people just should know what what this is like. I think it's so easy to just say, well, this is a trade asset and forget this is a human being. They're not an asset, they're a person. They're an asset to a team, yes, but like they're still a person. And you kind of like can't forget that. You have to take that in stride and keep that in mind with every trade rumor, negotiation and everything else that goes on. So it's refreshing to hear because too often players 
are treated so poorly, like in arbitration, have told like you don't have value, but actually we're gonna need you to get in net every day and take a bunch yeah. of hundred mile per hour shots to the head and be okay with it. Yeah, well, I appreciate the honesty, and uh, you know, it's likely that Markstrom's on a different team next year anyway. So we'll see if the Flames um, can continue to attract free agents when they are looking to do that, or if this creates ripples. Uh, moving on post deadline, we have, of course, the inevitable um, injury bug that is hitting at some of the most crucial times for some of the teams, both locked into the hunt or really trying to stay in the hunt. And let's talk first about the Vancouver Canucks goaltender Thatcher Demko pulled himself out of Saturday's game versus Winnipeg. And it's now come out that he is week to week. TSN is reporting that it is a knee injury. They are estimating two to four weeks. Although what I had last seen officially from the coaching staff was just a week to week status. Uh, we know Vancouver fans' nerves are already fried because they're convinced everything bad is going to happen to them at all times. Sarah, is Vancouver going to be okay without Thatcher Demko for two to four or perhaps longer weeks? Yes. Um, if you get hurt at all, you don't want to, but I think in the dog days of the season might be like, okay, let's get you healed. Let's get you all wrapped up and ready to go and excited to play again before the playoffs. Um, obviously you don't want to see it go more than four weeks, but they're going to be fine. Maybe it'll even show them kind of what they're working with when it comes to depth. So I guess we'll see. Shayna, are you worried for Vancouver or is Vancouver going to be able to endure this absence of their number one goaltender? If it's just regular season, I think they'll be fine. If it goes into the postseason, I would be very worried, not just yeah. about round one. It's what's past that because there's some really, really, really good teams in the league. And, you know, their team that's gotten by through stretches thanks to their goaltending, right? And I mean, what works in their favor is they've been really good defensively lately. You're seeing them after we've all talked about their shooting luck and their goaltending leading the way. I think that they've been really, really, really strong at five on five. So like Sarah said, like this is a chance to show what they're made of in front of their goaltender and teach them to win different ways, which is what you need in the postseason. Yeah. Um, and it helps that they said like he didn't re-aggravate a past injury. So I think that kind of helps a little bit too. So if they think it's just two weeks, even three weeks, I think it'll be okay. Yeah. Excellent. So hear that. Keep calm and carry on, our friends in the, the far Pacific Northwest. We believe in you. <laughs> All right. Another cup contender that um, we alluded to this in our deadline recap um, for the Florida Panthers. They acquire Vladimir Tarasenko, who comes in and in his first game. And of course, this was not intentional. It's just kind of hilarious that this is the sequence of events that leads to it. Tarasenko has a knee on knee collision with Aaron Ekblad, and now Aaron Ekblad is on IR and is expected to be out at least two weeks, is the report that I last saw. We'll ask the same question again for a different top-tier team. Sarah, is Florida going to be okay without one of their number one or two defensemen? Yeah, getting him back, I think some of us, including myself, forgot like how effective he is on defense, and getting him back was absolutely huge but now we're gonna just appreciate him again I think obviously they need him in the playoffs but that being said they're such a deep team and they've gone so far with injuries I think the way they've structured this team is just like built for the playoffs so hats off to that but obviously deep in the playoffs you're gonna want him for sure. And that's a great point because this is a team that also started the season without Aaron Ekblad from yeah. injuries he sustained in their cup run last year. Shane, are you worried about the Panthers at all over the next meh, 10 to 14 days? No, um, as long as they don't make them come back too soon, which I think yeah. is the biggest thing of it all. Like we saw them without not just Ekblad, but Montour. And after it took a couple of games for them to get on track, it was a rough go at first. Um I mean, I was so worried seeing Oliver Ackman Larson play those minutes those first couple of games. Then he yeah. just completely turned it around. And uh, it's like a credit to the players and the coaching. They were so good shorthanded. They were so good defensively with the Ekblad monster that I'm like, okay, you guys have got it. But Ekblad's the kind of player, I feel like he's come back from injury too early for the postseason. Like we literally saw that last year. Um, and 
it burned them in the end. They got so far, but then you just get to a point where like your bodies can't take it. So like they want to go on a deep run. They need to make sure if it's that extra third week, take it, just get healthy. Now I'm starting to think this is actually an all sub, uh, super secret undermining plot by the league to up scoring because the next injury we're going to talk about is not just is also a defender. So we've got a, a number one goaltender and two top tier defensemen out of the game right now due to injury. Um, let's talk about the injury first. We're going to get into the ramifications of the act that caused the injury, and that is Seattle's Vince Dunn. He takes a huge hit from Martin Prospisil, which I was like, I'm sorry, who are you, sir? Um, <laughs> the team was rightly upset about this hit. Um, Vince Dunn has skated with the team in a red no contact jersey. He elevated to normal jersey yesterday during the team's morning skate, but he has still not played with the team, keeping him out for, I do believe that's three games now. Um, and this is a Seattle Kraken team that desperately needs points and they're without not just one of their top two defensemen, but one of their top point earners on the squad. How concerned are you for Seattle without Vince Dunn? There is no timetable other than day-to-day -day, as stated by Dave Haxtall, Sarah. Yeah, I don't. They really need to squeeze some points out of where they're at right now, but then you don't. I love Seattle and I think the team is built to last and I really had high hopes for them this year, but like if one guy is going to keep them out of the playoffs, then maybe it's not the year for them, but maybe they will just say, screw it. We're going to go for it anyways. And we're fine. And then he comes back and it's like icing on the cake, but we're really going to have to pay attention and see. I think that's a huge point. If you have one player that totally swings your odds, you're just not, fully developed there yeah. yet. And and listen, I'm on record with that too. The Kraken are still building to be a true playoff contender. That's okay. They're three years old. Yeah. Literally. Literally. They're they're barely out of their diapers yet. They're toddlers. Yeah. So Shayna, what do you make of the loss of Vince Dunn to Seattle? Yeah. If he's the kind of player that you lose him and everything unravels, you have a problem. Like that's literally what's happening with Detroit right now without Dylan Larkin. Yeah. And we're all going, maybe you're not meant for the playoffs yet. So it's, yeah. it's going to be the same thing. It's, Compared to Ekblad, like, I'm more concerned for the Kraken here. Um, I think he's so important at 5-on-5 five five for their offense, which is, like, what we need from Seattle. Like, we know, they're, we know they're great defensively, and the goalies are stepping up. Like, they just need offense, and he's such a big source of that at 5-on-5. Five five. So I'm more worried for them, especially considering how important the stretch is. They don't have that same cushion. But yeah, it's that's this is going to be the decider for them. Are you ready for the playoffs? Are you not? And if you're not, sometimes is this what's going to push you lower in the standings so you don't just end up in the middle and you do get a better pick out of it? Absolutely. Well, we will watch those injuries, but let's go into the next chunk of news that we have. And those are the resulting punishments um, that have been handed out across the league. And one of them comes from that hint hit on Vince Dunn. As I mentioned, it was Calgary's Martin Prospisil who's in his rookie season. And I don't know like who pissed in his cornflakes that morning, <laughs> but like first he starts the game and takes an egregious hit on Adam Larson early in the game. Not okay. And then, I mean, the minute the hit on Vince Dunn was happened, like even Shana, you were in our chat being like, what the fuck was that? Like, it just was an unacceptable hit. And I am not being a homer here. I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who covers this league who thinks that hit was okay. But Prospisil is suspended three games. Again, a hit that Dave Haxtell called garbage on the record. The Prospisil suspension, three games. Sarah, too long, too short, or just right? Um, if anything, too short, but I'm going to say just right. Like, I think rookies, especially, there's this, we're going to get to this too, but there's like just a trend of rookies right now for some reason needing to be humbled. So that's hopefully a strong enough warning to like be like hey welcome to the show like we're, we're gonna take this serious for sure and I like and I said too to, when we were talking about this I was like I didn't think this was the player he was supposed to be I thought that this was supposed to be one of their prospects that they were looking to to be a full force contributor not just somebody right. to go out and goon it up like he appeared to do at least in this game Shana what do you take make of the actions by NHL player safety yeah, like I love when someone can have an edge and be a scoring threat. Like if you can be that full package, go off. That's great and wonderful. But I I really didn't like his game against Seattle. 
because it wasn't just the one hit. I hated the hit on Larson too. Like to me, he was running around the game in a reckless way that I would have, I wouldn't have minded seeing that extra game or two get tacked on there because I feel like if you're, if you're looking at someone for player safety, like we kind of know like what it's what we hear the rules to be, whether they're consistently upheld is another conversation, but we know it's things like the actual hit is what they're looking at. Then there's the factors of was a player hurt. That's not going to decide if someone gets suspended. It decides if the suspension is going to be longer. And it's like, well, you have a player hit uh, hurt here. And then it's, you know, was it malicious and things like that? And it's like, well, if it wasn't his first hit of the game and he just looked like he was being irresponsible numerous times in the game, doesn't that mean something? Shouldn't that add a little bit more on? Because if you're saying, hey, we want to make sure this doesn't happen again and a player learns from it, then like, I feel like there's a bigger conversation to have than just the one hit here. Absolutely. I completely agree. Well, we uh, we w- we wish Vince done well and, and that that suspension will has been levied and will take effect on Prospisil's season, of course. But as Sarah referenced, let's get to it. <laughs> the other player suspension that was handed down is to the New York Rangers, Matt Rempe. And specifically, the instance here is it an elbow on New Jersey's uh, Jonas Siegenthaler, who has now been announced as out due to a concussion. Matt Rempe is suspended for four games. I was pleasantly surprised. And to your point, Shana, you wonder how much the bigger picture of all of this factors into that evaluation. But we've talked already, and I will say again, the first concern for me always remains this player's health. I think the way he's taking on his role is putting his own long-term health at risk. But honestly, I'm kind of getting tired of this shtick. Like this is like the guy is playing barely six minutes a game and it's like, okay, when's he going to fight? Like, it's just like, there's so much happening right now with playoff races and then players doing incredible things. And like, I'm, I'm just kind of bored of this narrative. Matt Rempe, four games, Sarah, do you like the ruling that was handed down? Yeah, that's good please deter him and please that's, Hey, don't keep this up. Like we like what you're doing, whatever, like whatever the league is fucking trying to say at any time, but like, you know, like who actually knows, but like, to me, that's very much, Hey, rookie calm down. And you could see, I think the tone and the conversation shift when this game happened and you could kind of see even the like proponents of his game and like people that are, cheering for him we're kind of like all right buddy like let's stop and Curtis McDermott said like that's not cool and he lost respect for him and it's like it really is such a fine line when it comes to stuff like this like we could see this coming where he takes it too far and then something like this happens but he wasn't he never played like this like he always had an edge but like when he was in junior he didn't play like this and they like scouts have come out and said that. And it's just kind of, I wonder what he's going to, what's the situation going to be like when he comes back? Yeah. Shayna, this is a player who in 10 games with the Rangers has one goal, one assist and 54 penalty minutes. The most he's played in a game was 11 minutes versus St. Louis. But again, as I said, you're looking at barely close to six, um, if not closer to five on any given night. What do you make of this ruling on Rempe and what are you making of kind of how his role is either being dictated to him or the role he's dictating for himself? Yeah, um, I think four games is definitely more than I expected, but in like a good way. I was like, I'm sure they'll throw a game or two at him because, again, we we never know how this is going to go and if it could should, if it will go the way it should. Um, but with this one specifically, like like Tara said, this is not the player he was coming into the NHL. And I wonder how much he feels he has to do that to stay because like right before this game, there was a good question of whether he would be the one out of the lineup and let someone like Edstrom stay in the mix. So, and Rempe could be sent down because they just brought in two new players. Um, And instead it's someone like Johnny Brzezinski surprisingly sitting. So there are options right there to take a spot at any minute. And I felt like, he actually, when he was playing, was doing better. Like he had a a pretty good game before that. And then against the Devils, the biggest thing is he has a great shift, right? Like they score, you have the momentum, and then you do that. With some instances, it's been like, well, it's just his size and the players in poor positioning. And that can be true. But like 
if you're an NHL player, you have to learn how to have an edge and how to rein it in. And you have to know how to play with your size. Yes, things are going to happen. Like the game is fast and it might just be something like your elbow happens to be where someone's head is, but that wasn't the case here. Things can happen that are incidental and that isn't isn't the case here. And someone like him is not going to get the benefit of the doubt at this point because there are too many players getting hurt and him getting hurt. It just isn't viable for anybody long-term. So I think he really needs to learn how to be an effective player on the ice and not just in the box and how you can learn to make hits and be physical without just taking out opponents left, right, and sideways, because that's something no one wants to see. Um, Something like this, like everybody has takes with like Allison, I know what we've talked about, like when you post a clip of this, the reactions are like insane. And I tweeted one thing about this, no video. And people are like, he's such a plug and blah, blah, blah. And just like yelling at me about it. And I know everyone has mm -hmm. so many takes on it. So it's like hard to like, just have like a logical answer. Like he, I think he can be more than just a plug if he learns, but he needs, he needs to like really rethink how he's playing right now. And this, if this doesn't do it, I don't know what will. Yep. And it's all going to be, you know, if you've read books like Boy on Ice, it's all going to be too what he gets rewarded for off the ice and what he gets directed to do um, by those who are his bosses. So we'll hope that that this all kind of changes the narrative around this player going forward. All right. We have one more suspension, folks. And this, <laughs> this one, <laughs> I think we can have a little fun with because it is for, unfortunately, friend of the pod, John Tortorella. <laughs> Those of you. Official coach of the pod. Coach of the pod. Unofficial. Unofficial coach unofficial of the pod. Unofficial coach of the to, pod. We'll accept. John Tortorella. Yes, Sarah. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> oh, no. I'm just thinking about it all. Taking it all in. <laughs> so if you aren't aware, and if you aren't aware, I feel badly for you that you missed this much entertainment. But in uh, Saturday's game, <clears throat> excuse me, against Tampa Bay, John Tortorella is one of his former teams where he did win a Stanley Cup with that team As they're in, honoring the building, him, like, in the building. The Flyers, who are really suffering from some injuries to their back end right now, are down 4-0, less than 10 minutes into the game. There were, many are agreeing, some questionable calls by the on-ice officials. And when John Tortorella was ejected, I think he's the fifth coach to be ejected from a game this season. It's going up, my friends, but um, he refuses to leave the bench. <laughs> so um, he let the officials know exactly what he thought of their ejection. And as a result, when he finally did leave the bench, um, the resulting punishment handed down was a two-game suspension and a $50,000 fine, which we should note had already been approved to be paid for by Flyers ownership um, because uh, the quote was that the from Flyers CEO Dan Hilferty, I'm really proud of Torts for standing up for his and our team. This new era of orange is about having each other's backs. Last night, Torts had our collective backs. I respect any action the league might feel a need to take, but if it includes a fine, I am paying it. Uh, we are going to own our bias here. As I said, we believe that we have he is the coach of the pod. We do have Torts merchandise available at too many men merch.com that we have had for a while. And through this month, if you buy any of that, all the proceeds we are going to donate to pause a pet and humane pet humane based charity that John Tortorella has aligned with during his time in Philadelphia. But Sarah, it was ridiculous. It was entertaining. It was also concerning from an officiating perspective. What are your comments on John Tortorella's suspension? I feel like, with the amount of coaches getting ejected, I feel like you kind of got to let them have emotion. I don't know. It's an emotional game. It's enter like you said, it's entertaining. I, there needs to be something has to give with the officials at some point where it's like, okay, are we going to get a pool reporter to give us quotes on from an official? Like this happens in every other sport. Like there has to be, there's been strides made where like, Dave Jackson's on ESPN giving his takes and stuff. But like my take is obviously torts is going to torts. And I wish there was more transparency with officiating. 100%. It's, it's, I've said this for years. It's really frustrating that coaches have to answer for their actions. Players have to answer for their actions. It's literally mandated by the CBA and agreements with the media, but we can't get clarity 
from officials, which oftentimes not necessarily to, to blame them, but to understand what was going on and what led to that. It's really, really frustrating. But, you know, yes, of course, if you watch the torts video, you can see that he was certainly not being the most friendliest neighbor um, in the village. But, you know, even like Sheldon Keefe, when he got ejected earlier this season, you watch that video and I don't see what it is he does to lead to his ejection. Shana, what do you make of maybe some cracking down on coaches, particularly if we don't necessarily always know what happened and then specifically the tort situation? It felt like they just wanted to settle the game there. And I think that's why they handed, it was a 10 minute misconduct to Hathaway, which was like a little bit much. And I get sometimes the refs need to settle situations, but to me, it's always funny when they choose to and when they don't, because there are so many scenarios. Like, I don't know, look at that Calgary Seattle game where you could have started dishing out punishment to avoid things escalating. I just, I think if you're going to do that, you do have to go to the bench and maybe explain why or tell a player, tell someone. I think that if you're going to start sending players out for more than two minutes, it's not bad to have an explanation. And obviously nobody wants games to slow down to the point where you're watching a ref and a coach argue five minutes. I mean, I personally will love it. That's just me. But like, I know most people don't want that, but it just feels like I get that there's a level that everybody has. And sometimes you feel like that's the move, right? It, it's, it's, it gets attention, but it's odd how much it's happening this year. I just feel like if it's good, if you're going to do that more this year, maybe the league is involved. We don't know. We've seen it before. Like, Hey, make sure you call more penalties here. Be stricter here. Be whatever. If you're going to do that because it's in the rule book and you can, that's fine. But then there needs to be a little more disclosure about it. And just a little bit more openness on why just even if the refs aren't like, you know, being fed to the sharks with the full media press, like there's, there's a way to do this, to get comments out there besides some like bland league statement that we don't even get. So um, yeah, the cracking down is interesting. It leads to more drama. This situation I love every second of, I personally love that it happened with towards more because I know he's going to give us a show. And also me, a lip reading expert over here. I love, how you could catch most of it. Like he was saying like, I'm staying right fucking here. And I'm like, hell yeah, you are. I'm like <laughs> cheering on the TV, like having a great time. Um, I love that he did that on the night they honored the 04 team and everyone's so having good. drinks in the suite and chilling. And he's on the bench, like doing his thing. Really appreciated every minute of the entertainment. Um, and honestly, I'm happy for him that he gets two games off in the season. Like, why not? <laughs> Just know. like go relax and pet some dogs. Like have Horses. a great time. He's in the horses now too. He has horses. I I like this. This is the continent. See, I need, I need the flyers to rent you for like a day or two to do an uncharted series, <laughs> horseback riding to the dog shelter with torts to go pet some dogs. We need this. <laughs> well, it should be said too, that unlike um, our poor New Jersey devils, um, a sort of new coaching bump did help them. They were able to beat San Jose, which certainly uh, would seem to be an expected outcome, but you still have to win the game. Um, not all teams have this season. And then they will face uh, Toronto on Thursday and a credit to um, a coach we've talked about on here before, Brad Shaw, who's one of the assistants in Philadelphia. It's great to see him get some shine for um, maybe a little bit bigger spotlight. He's a, a really excellent coach. And so I'm happy to see that he gets an opportunity to to flex his coaching muscles a little bit more. Um, anything else we want to say on the tort situation? I like I like that it was Bradshaw right. getting the bump too. Yeah. Um, I hope Columbus is taking notes of that one when that back back in the day when they hired the wrong Brad yeah, to stay was... on. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Larson, but um yeah, Bradshaw right there. So I think I think that's cool and exciting for him to get the opportunity to to do this because these games are so important for Philly. Like they're, they're right there in the thick of the race. And like this could derail a team. I also think it speaks to the system that they have there, but it's always interesting how teams um, play differently when their head coach is in there. And we, we've been seeing it a little bit more like the COVID years. We saw it a lot more like this coach is out for a couple games. And, you know, I remember like with the Rangers, everyone making a big deal and Chris Knobloch took over for a glance and everyone's like, see, they like Knobloch better. And it's like, no, but I'm sure you're thinking we have to step up a little bit more if our coach isn't there. Sarah, have you reached out to bestie Sean Couturier for any comment? <laughs> nope. Don't think I can do that. If I don't nail his name. 
<laughs> so okay, that's why me and Leon don't text all the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the reason why. <laughs> that's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that is all the Bitto news that we had. And that's a whole bunch of Bitto news. So we will wrap this episode feeling a little bit more caught up after the trade deadline and all the news that's happening. We will continue to bring you our takes, our thoughts on all things hockey around all parts of hockey. Don't forget that if you would like to sport some, t- oh, shoot, just kidding. It's March. We get a month. For women. Yay. Oh, whoa. One whole month. One whole month. One whole month. So in lieu of our favorite game, Fuck, Mary Kill, as we started last episode, we are honoring one woman each every episode to give them a little shine. Shayna, you go first this time. Okay. Um, I am giving a shout out to official friend of the podcast, Lisa Dillman, who is like to me like a legend for women in hockey she is amazing i love i love her work um through the years and as a person she is so wonderful and so helpful and she's so experienced in so many different sports and just i feel like has helped break barriers for women and also just is always like so kind with her time and like which is what you want because like we know the men aren't gonna be with us they don't have the time the patience the energy for anything except for themselves sometimes so it's always nice it feels like women have to help women sometimes and some oddly don't want to do it because like I get it you don't want to be put in that box but like for me Lisa someone who just has always been like a kind ear and helpful and wonderful with everything so definitely want to give her a shout out Sarah yeah she's great I'm gonna go Julie Stewart Banks I think she's paved a really interesting path for herself she's authentically herself she also is very real and when I think about people that have definitely helped me on my journey she's someone I can always reach out to when I need to like, you know, like the best part of our women's club in hockey, our small women's club is like people to validate, wait, I'm not crazy. Right. Or like, wait, I'm being fucked over right now. Right. And to have Julie be really honest about those things. I feel like we have a similar career path and like it's meant a lot to have her exist and help me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and through that she helps us all let us just say so snaps to both of them for sure i am going to shout out <clears throat> a kraken employee and too many men listener katie spence uh who is part of our graphic design team and is just honestly one of the most creative and funny and clever and stylish people i know and it was funny we were talking about her in our chat with she had sent a nice tweet about the show and I was reminding you guys of some of the things that you have brought back to the table and said, hey, this is a really cool thing the Kraken are doing. I'm like, yep, that was Katie. Yep, that was Katie. And I think seeing a woman so fully in herself and so fully in her craft and just killing it and making new and different and exciting things in this sport is is awesome to see. So hats off to Julie, to Lisa, and to Katie. We love you guys so much. All right. Once again, Torts Merch through the end of March, all proceeds donate paws to help animals in need. You can get other Too Many Men merch too if you'd like at too many men merch.com. And don't forget, we are on social at two underscore much underscore man. If you have things you want to hear us talk about, or if you just want to let us know what you think, as long as it's nice, you can contact us on those platforms. We'd love to hear from you. And until we talk again, as always, we ask that everyone do whatever they can, no matter how big or how small, it all makes a difference to make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. We will talk to you soon. Love you. Bye.